thank you so much for sharing your intelligence and your poetry and your story. I just want to jump in with you because I have so many questions. <laughs> Okay, I have to tell you one thing. First of all, what? thank you for saying poetry. That you're the yeah. first person in any interview who has said that. And I really did feel like this book was poetry to me, parts of it. So thank really you for true. saying that. And also I have to tell you a hysterical thing, which is that I watched every minute of your book club, your untamed book club, when you were talking to Nadia. Yes. And I was requesting to join over and over and over again. And Are you I, kidding me? I called my sister. I'm like, this is a hard book club to get into. Like, <laughs> they wouldn't let in. They wouldn't let me in. And I wrote the book. It was amazing. Oh my gosh! Well, of course I would have accepted it. I just didn't see it. We were so like back oh, and forth. I was just. Was I felt so like good. I was just like a, a, a rabbi's little pup just sitting in the oh. seat. Isn't <laughs> Tell she me something? Everything. Incredible. Both of you, both of you are amazing to listen to. I just sat outside and just watched it. Just so good. Mm -hmm. So good. Well, I'm glad that you could enjoy without feeling like you had to. Yeah. Because, you know, we would have asked you all of the questions then. So now <laughs> I get to now. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. And I have a number of questions that I wanted to ask you. And you just let me know however much time you have. We'll grab okay. whatever you can. But I wanted to start off with the very beginning, because you paint the scene for us at the zoo where I can just, from the very beginning, I can feel the agitation. Like I can feel the sweat, like the boob sweat. I can feel like the people around me. I can like feel like the drink in my hand and all of these things. I can hear the, the, the EQ of the zookeeper that's tinny and abrasive. And then here comes Tabitha, and not only is she caged, but she's covered. Mm. And I thought for me, that word, and I know it's intentional because every word that you use as a poet is intentional. It was so poignant um, because they cover her until they want her to please and perform, right? And they cover her because they don't want her to know where she's from. And they don't know, want her to know where she's going or how she got there. They just want to pull the blanket off and have you perform. Mm -hmm. And immediately my, my head just went into this deep dive of, okay, we have 70, 774 million illiterate adults mm -hmm. and two thirds of them are women. Mm -hmm. And that for me feels like our covering. It mm -hmm. feels like we've been covered. And so I wanted to ask you as it concerns women's edu education, and reading, um, what role has reading and education played in your own untaming? Wow, sister, that was so freaking beautiful. Oh God. I mean, let's just take a minute. Wow, that was so beautiful, the way you described it, the way nobody has said it to me that way before about just, just showing up to perform. I mean, wow, okay. Um, well, I mean, for me personally, you know, since I was an itty bitty thing, reading mm -hmm. was the first escape from, um, from an uncomfortable existence that I ever had. So I was the one, the kid who was always in the corner with a book, always, always. Um, and it was the one place where I felt that I could really see other people because the, the, the issue with being human beings that always have to perform, one of the things that keep women from rising is that we never really get to see each other, mm. right? Because we are always just showing up with our performance faces on, with our, you know, identities, with our, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a worker, I'm a, wife, and playing those roles. And so when that's why in every single revolution where you see women coming together, it's where they actually start getting real, right? Mm where they say, actually, when I'm saying I'm fine, this is what I'm feeling on the inside. Actually, right. this is how I feel in my home. This is how I feel in my marriage. This is how I feel in my family. This is how I feel in my work. This is how I feel as a member of a political state that it completely and totally oppresses women. It's those real moments. And that's what I found in reading all the time, right? Just where I could see the insides of people and not just the outsides. Mm -hmm. that's liberating, right? Because you realize you're not alone and maybe there's a whole army of you out there 
right? And then, I mean, reading is what, I mean, forever, in any sort of fundamentalist religion, you know, the number one thing for, for, and I'm not sure it's even just religion. It could be every institution that needs allegiance from people mm -hmm. and needs to control people. The first thing they do is teach you not to trust yourself, right? right. I mean, that's the lesson right away, all the time. And we know it well in fundamentalist Christianity where the, it's overt. It's like, so here's the thing. Your heart is wicked. Do not lean on your own understanding. Do not want more. Do, I mean, it's just like you're told over and over again, you cannot trust this, hmm. right? Um, and so that's so freaking confusing um, because if you can't trust yourself, then you have absolutely no agency whatsoever, right? You, you constantly have to um, doubt yourself and trust what they call God, but which is what is really just a bunch of people trying to control you and self-appointing as the gatekeepers of God, right? Mm -hmm. It's not God at all. God right. is something else. God is the thing in here that right. we're told not to trust. Right. <laughs> right? Yes. And that's the crazy thing about religion. That's the mind fuck of it. It's like in God's name, they cut you off from God. So reading was so important. For, I mean, had I not started really reading about the history of the church and the history of an indoctrination and the history of how all of this crap started, I mean, all it takes for you to stop believing that shit is a few good books. Right? It's all so obvious. Like, you know, the way that even the religious right came together, mm. um, you know, they put the decals of, of abortion and gayness mm -hmm. on top of what was always just a mission to keep their private schools segregated. They just needed a galvanizing issue mm -hmm. to get their evangelical basis to start voting. Yes. Because they weren't voting, right? So they yes. had to find a way, they had to find a couple issues that they could make seem so dramatic and so imperative mm -hmm. that it would get people going to the polls. And still to this day, unexamined evangelical Christians think that they're out there fighting for abortion and against gay rights when really it was all just a cover, right? Mm -hmm. For a bunch of wealthy men to keep their money in racism. And these are not like wild ideas. These are just facts that you can find in books and articles, right? Nice. The point being, if women cannot read and cannot be educated, they can never learn enough to start challenging the people who control them. Mm -hmm. And that is the whole point of keeping women covered. Because in order for patriarchal cultures to continue, they need us to not know a lot. Right. Okay, so you quote Ralph Waldo Emerson in your book, who is one of my all-time favorite writers. And what I find interesting is that Walt Whitman was actually inspired by Emerson. And Whitman has this quote on one of Emerson's books that says, I was simmering, simmering, simmering. Emerson brought me to a boil. And I thought, man. Shut up. Yes. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. Like That's the interconnected. Serious. Yes. Oh, These people, like, what I love so much about literature and about writers and about just the chief thinkers of our time is that if we would expand and evolve and read and entertain new ideas and new curiosities, like the intersection of these, these writers, these poets, these scientists, they were all intermingled. Like they, mm -hmm. it was never one person mm -hmm. singularly on their own kind of trailblazing through mm -hmm. everyone has been interconnected. And so now you spoke about this before about how it feels like I want to write the same thing, but I don't want to steal your words. Someone said that to you, I believe, yeah. and you said, it's okay, just use your voice. But this, yeah. is, this is that sort of domino effect that creates wave and that creates change and that allows you, know, you to inspire me and, and me to inspire someone else. And, and really that's where our revolution comes from is, is from allowing ourselves to pick up a damn book yes. and to see life in a different perspective and to enter into the skin of another human and go, mm -hmm. I can't 
be angry at her. Mm -hmm. I can't spend my life trying to figure out whether or not she's right or wrong because I love her now. Like my empathy overtakes my righteousness. And that is what I feel like is so scandalous and so beautiful about what you are doing and what anybody who has the guts to just write down their story Mm -hmm. is doing. I want to know, like for you personally, what, give us like two books that brought you to this boiling point. Oh, okay. I will. Um, first of all, that is so beautiful. And I feel like that is the reason why it was so important for me to tell the Tabitha story and for the refrain, the entire refrain of the book to be, you are not crazy or a goddamn cheetah. Because if we do not hear other women's stories who are simmering the same way we do, we're simmering, then we think our simmering means we're crazy. Right. Right? It's like the 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 universal gaslighting of right. women. Right? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh no, no, you're not angry. You're not discontent because like you can't imagine more because you were made for more. It's because you're not grateful enough. Just calm down. Right. But then when we see and read other women's stories and we're like, oh my God, it's not just me. Oh my God, it's not just me. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's so good. Okay, I'm trying to think of, I mean, women who run with the wolves. Um, yes. That really, I go back, back to that, back to that, back to that. I mean, there's not a Audre Lord. I can't, they're all, I can't, I don't stop reading. Like I just, I inhale um, books like their food. And I have always um, felt like writers were my friends. Mm. <laughs> like I am a, a real severe introvert. And so, um, you know, and, and it, for me, they, uh, they haven't always had to be, you know, Anne Lamott is the, I just was writing about her like a minute ago. I read Traveling Mercies when I was still just wasted all the time. And I wanted so desperately to get sober. Um, there is this thing when you're a committed alcoholic where you think you're like really cool and edgy. And like, if you get healthy, you will lose your cool. Now, there's not a freaking cool thing about you, okay? Like, I was just, like, ruining everyone's lives constantly. I, I was, like, not even vertical. I was, like, a complete mess. So there was nothing cool about it, but I still felt like I had this edginess that sobriety would take from me, right? This is the BS that writers always think. Like, if I get healthy, I won't have any good material left. Well, we're even told, like, write drunk, edit sober. Hemingway said that. I know. <laughs> God, I mean, come so on. bad. We, I mean, that's just like <laughs> alcoholics will say anything to like keep it going, right? <laughs> yeah, it's true. But I remember reading her and thinking, oh, like I can be sober. If she can do this, I can do this. Like mm-hmm. I could be sober and be really complicated and still curse and write about God. I can be everything, mm-hmm. you know? So she was one of a major liberating force for me because I have always had this thing inside of me that maybe has resisted religion or or felt the simmering inside of religion, but I've always had this like, yes to like the, the divine. Like I didn't want to choose either or, you know, I didn't want to like abandon the idea of faith to the hijackers. I'm remembering and, um, one of the stories that you shared um, about this kind of religious dismantling that was mm-hmm. taking place for you and how you had had a conversation with a friend where you said, thank you for recognizing the intellectual conflict here that you can't say, I love you, but, mm-hmm. and, and, not, and, and, and not be um, supportive of you know, the rights of my family and, mm-hmm. and the rights of who I love. Yeah, it makes me think about the church right now. I just have this really big problem with this idea that all are welcome. Like they have these on their billboards. All are welcome. Everyone, come on in. Come on in. We love you. All are welcome. But they're still marginalizing and oppressing people like qualified, intelligent, you know, scholars. They're they're oppressing and marginalizing them based upon sexual orientation and gender. Yeah. And that's not and race. And race. And race. I mean, that's why you can't even 
nobody on earth who wants to know where a church stands should ask, who do you welcome? Like, that is just the BS question. Like, you walk right in and you say, who do you have leading? Right, right. You, that's the only question you need to ask. Mm -hmm. Who's on the pulpit? Who's in charge? If there are no leaders in this moment in time, if you're at a church where there are no leaders who are black, who are brown, who are differently disabled, who are gay, who are trans, like mm -hmm. they have had the time, then that is purposeful. If yes. all of the leaders in a church are white males, mm -hmm. they have made their decision, yes. right? So you do not ask, who do you invite? Right. You ask, who do you allow to lead? For my community that I'm building right now, so many of us are in this man dismantling process. We're like mm -hmm. sifting everything out every, and, and we're finding like the hidden gems that is our true faith, this true unassailable faith. And we're, you know, kind of allowing to shed and to sift out everything else, but it can feel really lonely. Yeah. Well, that's, that's lonely. the whole, that's, that's the fact of it. It's like the more progressive, so so we have always created communities where you have to choose your individuality or your belonging. Right. Okay. That's how we make communities in our world, right? It's it's the challenge of our time to recreate what constitutes a community. And you know, I mean, it, it, it's it, it's not just religion. I mean, of course, I have so many friends who are in in religious groups who don't believe half of what's said. Mm -hmm. right they don't they don't believe it but they're not gonna raise their hands because of the inevitable price of doubting of, of stepping out of line I mean the shaming the the um it's it's really just like a shunning it's yes. like a shunning that happens yeah um but like that's not just religion I mean if, think about being a little boy who steps out of line with gender roles as a child think about being um a straight person who's suddenly not like thinking mm -hmm. if you dare to step out of uh, line in any group mm. the, the 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 shaming will be swift and it will be fierce and it will be punishing right mm -hmm. so i think the challenge of our times is to begin to create communities where people can not have to choose between who they are and their belonging right? Mm -hmm. How do we create places where we don't necessarily have group mindset that, that if you step out of line with, you get kicked out. And that's really hard, right? That's why progressives have such a hard time because, man, I mean, all of my, just so you know, all of my progressive women faith who, who are still in the faith, in any kind of faith, feel lonely. Mm. It's just a wilderness of like... <laughs> A wilderness of, <laughs> with, and I mean, this is scriptural, scriptural, right? Like Jesus is like, mm -hmm. there's no place for, for a prophet to lay his head. Like he mm -hmm. didn't have a belonging, right? A place to belong to because, and you know, Maya Angelou said, like, if you, if you don't belong anywhere, you can belong everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. Paul mm -hmm. Corinthians said, Paul said, you know, my job is to become everything to everyone, which means that you're no one you're not, you don't have like that fierce belonging. It's a way of being, yes. it's a way of life, um, but it is really lonely. And for a long, there's a lot of people who would rather, who would, who know that mm -hmm. and who would to choose, who choose to give up that fierce, lonely simmering for mm -hmm. the protection of the fold. Right. Well, it reminds me of, I think what's, what makes it so hard for us as well is that this is like a primal biological instinct like from the beginning of time where in order to survive we had to create herd so right. those of the certain biological you know in the, in their genome pool would pool together and then the people that or the animals that didn't really fit in they would be ostracized kicked out even killed and yeah. so there's a part of this that is somewhat primal in nature and makes sense really? to me when I, when I look at this peer pressure and status quo and this, like, you know, don't overturn the apple cart, you know, <laughs> don't um, push outside. It can make people just full of fear because mm -hmm. their, their protection is gone. And in that way, it is a wilderness. It is a yes. wilderness to say, stepping out of my cage. First of all, I know now that I'm caged and I'm going to be brave enough 
to exit the cage and not know what I'm going toward. And not have the protection of the trap of the, you know, the zookeepers or the right. Yeah, but I, I feel like this I feel this idea that while it has been true that the survival of our species has largely been to assimilate into herds and not step out, mm -hmm. that at this moment in history, it's gonna require the reversal of that instinct. Yes. Right. And I yes. mean that literally. Like, yes, I agree. Like we literally, like for the survival of our planet, mm -hmm. we need people to step outside of the mind control of, of, of climate denial and say, actually, I believe in science. Actually, we need like Republican senators to step outside and say, actually, he's that shit crazy. We need Democrats to let, we need people to work together. We need men to step outside of male um, of patriarchy and say, actually, this is not like, I will, I will, I will withstand the, the herd shaming of my gender to stand with them, right? We need white women to give up, denounce their own benefits of white supremacy and stand with black women. Like mm. it feels like right now is a moment for as many people who are brave enough to, to rock the boat and like return to their individual conscience mm -hmm. above the safety of the, 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 the herd, that that's our only shot. Yes. And about your like idea of what a, have I found a, a place, like a yes, place. Yes, have found we, a church or a place or community. The true answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. I, um, I have been a part of many churches because I want that so badly and have wanted that so badly. I don't know that I want it anymore. The, I, I did find a place that I felt at home and I felt so grateful for for a long time and I was a big part of that church. And then this thing happened where it just was a mess. It, it was a situation where it became very clear that the church was choosing its finances over the well-being of one of our most precious members. And it was so sad and upsetting and clear. And I really wonder about church. I do. I, I wonder how, how it's possible if one of the clearest directives, which was, you know, you can't serve God and money, mm. how, why churches even think that they can do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? yes. Well, I because will. Because institutions yeah. are money driven. Yes. And, and if, if how, I mean, the only churches I trust are the ones who are constantly falling apart. Mm. and reinventing themselves like who are just constantly giving it all away and starting over yeah but the second you build a building and you hire people and you start mm. to like first of all that was never mentioned like that was nowhere in the gospel that was nowhere that was created that was all man-made you know christianity wasn't anything that jesus mentioned Right. He didn't even have a home. He just walked around barefoot and like took care of people. I love that part in your book where you talk about who Jesus might look like today, mm -hmm. who he would be today, because then he was he was so wildly subversive against all of the institutions and the people that he were he was angry at were these Pharisees and these scribes, and these religious, you know, elders that that kind of created this persona to maintain the moral withstanding of the people to keep them in line. And so like, I love the woman, I call her the woman caught by grace and not the woman caught in adultery. I mm. think that's who she is to me. You know, Simon yeah. the leper okay. is not Simon the leper. He was healed. Like why okay. we have to hold on to the grit and the, the, you know, the wrong of people is just beyond me. But anyway, yeah. okay. so the woman caught by grace, like Jesus totally ignoring them. You know, they're angry at him and they're speaking at him. And, and he says, he basically calls them on their own deal. You mm -hmm. know? And yeah. I thought, my goodness, he's protecting the weak. Mm -hmm. He's protecting the woman. He's giving a voice to the outcast. Mm -hmm. He's welcoming the children. He's welcoming the immigrants. He's welcoming the people that otherwise would have been completely marginalized in that culture. And so who mm -hmm. Jesus would be today is so unlike, I don't even know that he would be able to be a pastor because of the protection that he 
gave and stood up for and died for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, when, and also when you think about like who he would have come as, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, the fact that with the exception of him choosing to be a baby girl, in my opinion, that would have even been better, but okay, God. <laughs> I mean, the, the I love the form of it, right? Like they were expecting this king, this royal, powerful king, and 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 Jesus comes as this infant, like completely vulnerable from the most despised and, and outcast group, yeah. right? That so then you think about okay, if if Jesus were going to show up again today, if God were going to show up again today, who would God choose? to represent God's self. And that would have to be whoever we can think of that is the most vulnerable, most marginalized. Mm -hmm. Um, Like for without, for sure, God would be like a trans woman, a black trans woman, right? That's who Jesus would be. Or Jesus would be like a little girl in the, um, separated from her parents at the border in a, in a camp right now. Like Jesus would be, would come as the one that, the folks who Jesus called whitewashed tombs and broods of vipers, he would come as the one that they most put outside the circle. Hmm. Right. So I always just think of if there's any, I mean, even people that call themselves Christians, I love what Maya Angelou said. Somebody said, I'm a Christian. And she said, really already? (laughs) (laughs) Brilliant. Wow, you've got that locked up. Really? You're 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 living like Jesus did. Really? Really? <laughs> wow. Bold claim, right? Mm-hmm. But I mean, if anything, the question would be, okay, so if you are inspired by Jesus's life, then like how are you standing with the most vulnerable? Mm. That's the only question that I think could possibly have anything to do with being a Christian. Thank you for drawing all of our attention to that because you, you frame it in such a way that makes it hard to excuse it any longer, you know, mm-hmm. and it makes it hard to unsee it. It's like, if you've been hanging out in the gift shop at the Grand Canyon your entire life and someone comes up behind you and goes, hey, by the way, the Grand T- Canyon's like actually 200 yards mm-hmm. that way. Like, you can't unsee it. You can't unlearn it. Right. You can't hold it back up again. Like once mm-hmm. you realize and see the Jesus of the Bible, mm-hmm. it is like stepping face to face with the Grand Canyon that's completely unexplicable and it's can so never be repainted. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you, I'm kind of shifting gears, but I wanted to ask you about Glennon the writer. Like at mm-hmm. what writing at what part in the writing process did you go to the zoo? And did that just completely completely send a shockwave through the rest of the writing of the book? Yeah, what a good question. So I don't think that, I mean, I know that when I saw that um, cheetah, it was in San Diego, we were out there, Abby and I were out there with the girls for some reason. Um, I remember thinking, this is it. Like, and I hadn't even written any of Untamed yet. Oh, you had no, okay. and 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 the, the deal is with with writing for me is like when I say I haven't hadn't written any of it, I mean I hadn't like sat down at the computer and typed out the words, but like it was building in my heart and head, and you know what the, I mean, it was all coming. It was like on the tip of my tongue, right? Yes. I couldn't start it until I had that experience. Like I needed to like it. It was my proof. For myself it was like see like if a if a wild animal like a cheetah can be tamed into forgetting who she is then so can a woman like this is the story that's gonna prove to them yes it's gonna prove it to them that they're not crazy that yes. they were meant for more that they are being covered that they are being caged it was like i needed that so badly um so i think it was like well before well I yeah, I'm so curious, like if you're, because you're a storyteller, and I love, by the way, just how, like I use I use the word poetic for a reason because of the way, as well that you structured the book, mm. these short little chapters, and and they felt like just small, like like glimmers of prose for me, you know, mm. that were just so I could go back and just read 
read them and reread them, like just these little nuggets of like beautiful truth. I just loved so much how you did that. But I was curious whether or not your story writing the book, did it take place in collection of these stories and then formulating how you wanted to structure the book or is it structure first and then looking for the stories? Okay, so good. I love talking about this stuff. Okay, first of all, one thing you need to know is that I wrote this book twice. So the first time I wrote it, it was crap. Okay, okay. it was like, it was like, um, I knew what I knew I wanted to write about women's wild and the oppression of women and the, but it was very like clinical, like it was like mm -hmm. essays about how we lose ourselves, but, but it was very, I don't know. And so Liz, Liz Gilbert is one of my best friends. She came to stay with me for a weekend and she was like, okay, read to me what you have. Mm -hmm. And I started reading and sister, she was just like sinking deeper into the couch. And I was like, it's, it's, it's not it. Is it and basically she was like, it's, it's not it. That's not it. And like, <laughs> And I was just like, oh my God. Like I knew, first of all, I don't take feedback from many people. Like Liz is one of the ones that I do. And also yeah. she was telling me something that I already knew, you know, because right. I knew it wasn't good. I just was hoping no one else would notice that it wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, maybe I've earned enough like writing chops that they'll right. just think that they don't get it. Like yeah. maybe they, will, they won't think it's me, it's them. Right. <laughs> so... So, so I had to start. Okay. Okay. So I had to start completely over. This is what I figured out is that I was writing a story. I was writing a book about how to break free from existing structures mm -hmm. and trying to write it inside an existing structure, like an old form of a Ooh, book, like, yes. right. Like stuffing new wine into an old wine skin. Like right. I was writing a book about women breaking free with their wild, but I wasn't writing it wild. Yes. Right. So yeah. what I real, what I realized is that I was writing about the book. I just wasn't writing the book. Yes. That's when I realized I need to write this book wild. Like I need to write it. Like I want people to read it. Like they're, they're the, they're Tabitha running. Yes. Like I want them to feel it in their toes and in their bones and in their, all the things, which is, is scary as a writer because your editors are going, what the hell is this? Like, are <laughs> No one's going to get this. No one's going to get this. The number of times I heard, no one's going to get this. And, and, and I had to be like, I think they will. I yes, think they, will. they will. Because we're all cheetahs. That's what I know, right? It makes me, you don't know the relief. You don't know the relief when I see brilliant women like you who are like, who just ma had all the matching simmering. Yes. And you know, and just like we bring each other to a boil. That's the most, be I'm so annoyed that Emerson said it first. Like, <laughs> that is it. That's it. That is it. Well, when when I look historically at the women and the, the poets and the mystics and the warriors who their decisions didn't align with the culture at the time or with the religious institutions of the time, but they still trusted their knowing. Yes. I think about... Mariah Mitchell and Sappho and Queen Vashti and Margaret Fuller and Rachel Carson and Jane Goodall, like these pioneering women, not just of action, but of thought. And I just want to thank you because I feel like you belong in that line of women who are trusting their knowing and who we're going to be able to look back and pick up your book again. And, and you belong in that lineage of women that have trusted their knowing rather than what the culture has said is the right way. So thank you for entrusting me and my sweet community that I love, that I'm working so hard to rebuild. You um, really are. You're doing your, such a beautiful job. Oh, You're doing well, such a beautiful you. job. Thank Aww. you. But thank you for entrusting us with your intelligence and your story and your poetry and mm -hmm. um, your love. It's a pleasure. Let's to stay in you. touch. We need each other. We, yes, we, we do. <laughs> you know, it's lonely out here. Isn't it? <laughs> yes, we need a campfire or something in our wilderness. <laughs> Every now and then. I think Renee uses that. Like, oh, I, does think she? That's, I think that's part of her wilderness book. I can't remember, but I think it's like. It's like we're out in the wilderness, but there's campfires everywhere that we join each that. other. Up. That I'm not that? That book. I need to read that book. Yeah. Thank you, Glennon, for your time. Bye, honey. Thank you so Bye. much. Love you.